announcements. I'm Jane Lang. I'm the director of the Nina Historical Society. This is Becky Kwiatowski. She's the assistant director. Um, we're really happy that you joined us tonight for this program. I'll just give you a couple of quick announcements for the Historical Society while um, Megan runs out to get Nicole and see if we can get the Facebook live stream working correctly. Um, happy that you're here tonight. And thank you very much for wearing masks. It's the policy of the library to wear masks, but we do have permission from them um, because it's easier to understand the speaker if they're not wearing a mask to be back here behind the plexiglass. So we appreciate you wearing masks here tonight. Um, I want to let you know, December, we do not have a program here at the library, but uh, January 20th, we will have a program. We haven't, uh, I think we're planning to just do a virtual program that night, and it's a, uh, it's a, uh, Nina's immigration stories, we wanted to feature one of the stories that is in our current exhibit, Tracing Our Paths, and that uh, presentation is an interview that we conducted in July with the Joshi family um, who came here from India in 1959. So that it will be a really interesting program and it's a video that um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Nick Jevney. <laughs> it's a video that he helped us create and Nick is the president of the Menasha Historical Society. He does a fantastic job with all of our video work and audio work, and we just are so thankful to him for all that he does. So please give him a round of applause. Um, in February, uh, February 17th, we'll be doing a program on Theta Clark. I'll be doing that program. I wanted to uh, give an overview of what her life was like. I think a lot of people are a little bit familiar with her, but I think we'll be informing you of some other parts of her life and some stories about her life that you may not be familiar with. So uh, join us for that program in February. As we were, oh cool, now it's working, great. Um, as we were uh, just mentioning the current exhibit that we have at the Historical Society, it's called Tracing Our Paths, Nina's Immigration Stories. It'll be in place for another year, but we just received yesterday, Christmas early, uh, a book that is a book we created on the exhibit, for the exhibit, which essentially walks you through the entire exhibit. So there are pictures of the exhibit and then the panels and the text stories, the photos, all about uh, the Tracing Our Paths exhibit that's now in place at the Octagon House. So we have copies of that available on the side table. They're $10. If you're interested, just um, let us know. We had so much fun and again, Nick was a big part of putting this together. So tonight we're presenting another Hidden History of Doty Island program. And we have so enjoyed doing this series. It's been a collaborative effort with the Menasha Historical Society. And we just love that partnership that we have with the Menasha Historical Society. Um, tonight's program, obviously, the Walter Brothers Brewery. But how we kind of started this series, and we'll kind of walk through quickly all of the different programs that we've done um, on the hidden history of Doty Island. We started thinking about all of the stories on the island. Are there any islanders here, by the way? Yay. <laughs> Good for you. Um, we started thinking about all the stories of the island that now are hidden because maybe the building is gone, people have forgotten. And we had this map where you can see Nicolay Boulevard running right down the middle of the island that's separating Nina and Menasha. The stories of Doty Island are really shared stories of Nina and Menasha. So we're so happy to have our partnership with Menasha on this uh, series of programs. This uh, map shows you all of the different spots that we've already covered. So we've already covered a lot of ground. We talked about the Whiting Boathouse, Picnic Island, Roberts Resort, the Memorial Building, Winnebago Day School, Winnebago Players, the Driving Park, the Barn, oh, the two tennis clubs, the Doty Tennis Club, and then the Racket Club, also known as the Barn, the Gilbert Paper Company, the Bonta Corporation, 
Samuel A. Cook and the Cook Armory. And our most recent one was Railroads and Depots last month. So we're so um, appreciative, truly appreciative, of Tom Van Leeshout and all of the work that he has done putting so many of these programs together. He has done an amazing job, job doing research, uh, collecting photos, collecting stories and articles, and just all the amazing history behind some of these um, hidden parts of the history of Doty Island. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Tom to start our program on the Walter Brothers Brewery. Thank you, Jane, and I'd also like to welcome all of you to this uh, video presentation that we're taping. Um, it's a pleasure presenting the series, The Hidden History of Doty Island. Tonight, the focus it will be the Walter Brothers Brewery, loca located on Nicolay Boulevard, or the Avenue, as it was called back then. This evening, we'll present it in three different sections. First, location. The corner of education, salvation, and damnation. <laughs> Next, we'll talk about America's beer brewing and the Walters family. And we'll end with the Walter Brothers Brewery in Menasha. But before I begin with the details, let me introduce myself a little bit more deep, uh, deeper and how I fit in on the island story. I was born at Theta Clark, lived on Hewitt Street in Nina, Nicolay Boulevard in Menasha, and I graduated from St. Patrick's grade school. All in all, I lived my first 25 years on the island. In this first section, we'll take a look at the location of the Walter, Brewer, Walter Brothers Brewery and the unique way the locals referred to the block that the brewery was on. Today's presentation, we begin with the discussion of the block. It is the westernmost portion of Nicolay Boulevard, the Menasha side. Notice Nicolay Boulevard, lower bottom, Washington Street on the left, and Anna Street on the right. Right in the middle, you'll see St. Patrick's Church. It has been there since 1883. At the eastern edge of the block, and pictured below, is Luigi's. Most of our presentation will take place at this corner. Note the Walter Brothers footprint in yellow. To the north, you'll see railroad tracks and the river. Both will play a major role in the growth of these two cities and the businesses that have access to them. Before Luigi's, between 1960 and the 1990s, there were several other businesses. Disco was a craze in the 1970s, and we had our own. At the, Cam at the Camelot, you could dance on a Saturday Night Fever style <coughs> disco floor as the DJ played songs by Earth, Wind, and Fire and the Bee Gees. The floor would light up to the beat. They also served an exceptional quarter pound tenderloin sandwich for those late night cravings. The disco floor and the DJ area was originally an optometrist office called Benson's Eyewear. And in 1962, the Wee Bowl opened for family entertainment. It offered a unique miniature-sized bowling alley. However, before the Wee Bowl, and for a hundred years, a brewery stood at this location. The Island Brewery was built on the corner of Anna and the Avenue. For almost 100 years, from 1868 to 1960, this block had a school, a church, and a brewery. Hence the nickname, the Corner of Education, Salvation, <laughs> and Damnation. <laughs> the first Catholic church in Nina Menasha was St. Charles, dedicated in 1857. In 1882, St. Charles burned down and was replaced with a new facility St. Patrick's, dedicated in 1883. St. Patrick's Church remains on this spot today. In 1858, 
A year after St. Charles was dedicated, the Island Brewery was built. This facility on Nicolet Boulevard will be the focus of the Hidden History presentation. The original building burned down, and in 1881, the building on the right replaced it that same year. In 1868, a school was built west of the church. This facility, pictured on the left, was sold to the Jersel Knitting Mills in 1900, and then moved a block south on Commercial Street. It was replaced with a second school. In 1940, a third more modern school was erected and expanded in 1960. Just recently, in 2015, this facility met the wrecking ball. Parish remains uh, retains this as a green space today. Let us begin with the details of the damnation portion of the of this story, the Walter Brothers Brewery. Notice the photo on the left, taken on the Nina side of Nicolet Boulevard. You can see both Brewery and St. Patrick's Church. In this next section, we'll discuss the development of beer brewing in America, along with the Walter, brother, or the Walter family and their breweries. The family will own six breweries, standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the major breweries of its time. At its zenith, the Walter brothers were among the largest breweries in the country. To better understand the story of our brewery on Doty Island, we must first understand beer in America. The best and simplest explanation came from the internet, specifically the Wikipedia. <laughs> the brewing traditions of England and the Netherlands brought to New York ensured that colonial drinking would be dominated by beer rather than wine. Until the middle of the 19th century, British-style ales dominated American brewing. This changed when the longer shelf-life lager styles brought by German immigrants turned out to be more profitable for large-scale manufacturing and shipping. The hops in lager had preservative qualities, while non-hopped local ales of the time quickly turned sour and were a perceived risk to drink. One of the earliest large-scale breweries was Best Brewing, later renamed the Pabst Brewing Company, a Milwaukee brewery built by German immigrant Philip Best in the 1840s. It began shipping its beer to Chicago and St. Louis the following decade, first by ferry and then eventually by rail, establishing an early trans-market beer brand in the United States. Other successful breweries of the era, begun by German immigrants in Milwaukee, included the Valentin Blatt's Brewing Company, Joseph Schlitz Brewing Company, and the Miller Brewing Company. By the 1860s, America had 1,269 breweries producing over a million barrels of beer for a population of 31 million. In just seven years, the number will expand to 3,700 breweries producing 6 million barrels of uh, beer per year. Wisconsin was also seeing breweries in most of their cities and towns. Oshkosh was producing cheap Oshkosh beer, La Crosse with Old Style, Chippewa Falls with Light and Kugels, Stevens Point was developing Point Beer, and Kenosha produced Old Kenosha Beer. Nina and Menasha, by 1960, had four breweries. One of those breweries was on Doty Island, and in 1888 was purchased by a family that emigrated from Germany. Let us look at this family and its influence on beer brewing in the United States. In the 1840s, unrest in Germany caused many Germans to emigrate to America to find a better life. Several members of the Walter family chose to leave Württemberg, Germany and emigrate to America in January of 1873. Traveling, by ocean, traveling the ocean by steam vessel, the trip took two weeks. They went directly to Milwaukee. Wisconsin had a large German immigrant population at the time, and the region reminded them of their home in the Black Forest region of Germany. 
Their father, Jacob, was a cobbler. The brothers expanded their knowledge of the brewing trade in Milwaukee before striking out on their own. Jacob and Elizabeth Walter were parents of 11 children. Some stayed in Germany. The Walter family created a large brewing dynasty. By the 1950s, it was one of the largest breweries in America. They survived the trials and tribulations from nearly a century of brewing operations that rivaled competitors, including the Bushes. Eventually, their father and mother would emigrate to America and settle in Eau Claire, living with daughter Anne. Jacob passed away in 1892, Elizabeth in 1902, at the age of 81. They both were able to see the beginning of the Walters Empire. Let us discuss the brothers and the family breweries. George was born in Wurttemberg on January 26, 1848. He received a liberal education and apprenticed to learn the trade of brewing at the age of 15. At the age of 21, he served in the Franco-German War for three years with the 6th Infantry. After the war, he resumed work in various German breweries. George wanted to improve living conditions for himself and decided to emigrate to America in 1873. He went to Milwaukee and found employment in at the Philip Best Brewing Company, which would later be renamed Pabst Brewing. After leaving Milwaukee, George worked for two years in Whitewater as a brewery foreman. In November of 1875, he was united in marriage to Mary Schlichter in Whitewater. A year later, he accepted a position in Carl Munch's Appleton Brewery, working as an assistant to Munch for four years. Teaming up with Frank Fries of Wing and Fries Beer Brewery, George developed a strong business relationship. George purchased the Star Brewery of Appleton, changing its name to the George Walter Brewing Company. George Walter passed away in May of 1899 at the age of 51. The cause of death was diabetes, for which there was no treatment at that time. His heirs continued to run the business. George Walters Brewery was located where the Appleton Police Station now stands in the southeast corner of West Lawrence and South Walnut Street. This brewery introduced a mild, light lager called Adlerbrau, German for Eagle Beer. It soon became the most popular beer in the area. Adlerbrau is currently being produced as a microbrew by Appleton Brewing Company. Upon George's early death, his heirs continued to run the business until 1903, when it became a corporation organized under the laws of the state of Wisconsin. Nine children kept the business after their father's death. However, the transition was not as smooth as they would hope. After the unexpected death of their father, family strife ensued as mother and children argued over the brewery. Manasha's Chris Walter stepped in to be the arbitrator. The issue spilled over into a shooting at the brewery and later one of the sons was in a horrific car train accident that killed one of George's grandchildren. Things settled down and in 1903 they renamed the facility the George Walter Brewing Company. In 1918 at the request of the federal government the Appleton Brewing and Malting Company dissolved its holdings and combined with the George Walter Brewery. This was done as a war measure to save fuel and other materials. After the start of National Prohibition in 1920, the George Walter Brewery, like so many other breweries, made a near beer. It was named Bravo. This beverage was not very popular, and the brewery closed after a few years. The space was then rented out to other businesses. With the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932, it was almost assured that Prohibition would be repealed. The brewery's board of directors met and discussed getting the brewery equipment back into shape for this expected repeal and started to once again brew beer. The brewery's first beer since the beginning of Prohibition was sold on May 9, 1933. After Prohibition, a series of regulations and restrictions were enacted for the brewing industry. Two of these were the Brewer's Code of 1933 and the Federal Alcohol Administration Act of 1935. These rules restricted the methods of selling and prohibited ownership and control over retail outlets. Before Prohibition, Walter Brewing had owned several pubs and retail outlets 
and in general had lawful control over these establishments. With the passage of the new rules, the brewery was forced to relinquish these outlets. As a result, larger, distant breweries were given access to local markets like the one in Appleton. The use of motorized vehicles also had a significant impact on small breweries. Beer trucks were a more versatile alternative to trains for the distribution of beer, making it easier for big breweries to compete on the local level. Like his older brother, George, John was born in Württemberg. At age 14, John began his training in the beer making business in Stuttgart. He came to America with his brothers in 1873 and settled in Milwaukee, working at Pabst. In 1874, John moved to Portage and was married that same year. After four years, they moved to Menasha. Then on to Spencer, Wisconsin, where John purchased a share in the town brewery, becoming a partner in the firm. In 1883, John bought the facility, thus establishing the first Walter family brewery in America. Walter's Beer was founded in Spencer, Wisconsin. They would bring a crisp German lager to a country accustomed to its ales and ports. A fire destroyed the building and forced a move to Eau Claire in 1890. In January of 1890, John paid $8,000 for Empire Brewery and renamed it John Walter Brewery Company. This brewery was an underperforming operation of the Leinenkugel family. John died during Prohibition. He was very active in his church. In 1892, he contributed money and time to erect the first German Evangelical Lutheran Church. Forty years later, he was buried from that very church. With no children of their own, Magdalene sold the brewery and assets to other family members who offered to purchase it after Prohibition. As mentioned, John Walter purchased the troubled Empire Brewery in 1890. Within a few short years, the John Walter Brewing Company became a successful operation. This was one of the first breweries to use steel lined tanks and an interior waste system with the tile drain pipes. Sales increased from 5,000 bar barrels per year to 50,000 per year until Prohibition closed the facility. Nephews Martin, Charles, and Edgar Walter, upon the passing of John, reopened it when Prohibition ended in 1933. Martin Walter served as president until 1967 and John Walter, also an owner, was the brewmaster to the end. By 1970, the facility was shipping 100,000 barrels, but orders slipped to 12,000 in 1984. The brewery remained in the hands of the Walter family until 1985, when it was sold and renamed Hibernia Brewery, which operated for several years. The buildings are now utilized for various commercial and industrial uses. Walter's beer is currently being brewed by Northwoods Brewery and Restaurant as a microbrew with a variation of the post-prohibition Eau Claire Walter's label, as well as in Pueblo, Colorado. Chris Walter was also born in Germany. At age 16, he left the homeland and settled in Milwaukee, working with three different breweries, including Pabst. He will move to Madison and Racine and work in a brewery and a malt house. Chris married Amelia Bixler in 1875. Orphaned at age 16, Miss Bixler, also a German immigrant, crossed the Atlantic three years earlier. The Walters will have seven children. Two sons and three daughters will survive to adulthood. Next, on to Appleton, where he will work for his brother George at the Star Brewery. <clears throat> then moved to Menasha and with several, several brothers, bought the Island Brewery in 1888 for $9,000, half of its original asking price. In 1910, Amelia will pass away. The following year, Chris will marry at a railsback. After relinquishing ownership of men and management of the brewery, Chris will leave Menasha and spend his remaining years in Florida and California. At age 76, 
1932, Chris will pass away, three months after his brother John. The Christian Walter House, constructed in 1896, located on Nicolay Boulevard, is an irregularly shaped two and a half story craft style resident featuring a veranda and foundation built in granite rock. Surrounding the property is a granite rock wall built into the front lawn. The roof is combination gable and hip, and the roof material is asphalt, while siding is aluminum with double hung windows, mainly four over four. While researching this presentation, we came across several interesting questions or stories about the home and the brewery. Rumor has it that there was an underground line between the brewery and the house. This was to bring beer to Chris for personal consumption and possible batch testing. We could not confirm nor deny this existence. However, we feel it might be highly unlikely. A true story is after midnight, barrels of beer would cross over the avenue and into Nina, as at that time, Nina was a dry city. <laughs> also, during hot summers, at, uh, during hot, humid summers, Chris would invite the, uh, uh, the, the walking beat cop into his house for a refreshment. <coughs> this is possibly true, as the beer taps are down in the lower level of the house. And finally, we heard that the brewery had outside taps for locals to come and receive same uh, receive samples uh, sips of beer. Again, this is possible as several other local breweries had outside taps. The first two Walter breweries Jane discussed were named after their owners, George and John, but the Menasha Brewery was named Walter Brothers Brewing Company. That's because in 1888, brothers Martin, Chris, and Matt owned the operation in the Menasha facility. Brother Matt will leave the facility and go back to Germany in 1890. Martin and Chris will build a strong bond and develop the signature gold label beer in 1891. This is what the Milwaukee papers were saying about the Menasha facility <coughs> after the purchase. A Milwaukee reporter interviewed a local lawyer as to his opinion of this firm and he said, this company, I believe, is entering upon a course of great prosperity. I consider the marriage of John Hrubreski to the daughter of Christian Walter as very important and it will benefit the company. This gentleman possesses financial talents of the highest order, coupled with genius in business matters. In credits, accounts, and records, he will be invaluable. Christian and Martin Walter are men of great practical experience and their department will be sustained if hard work and skill can accomplish anything. For Christian Walter, I have great respect. He is a self-made man. With the Walter's initial investment into the facility, growth was seen quickly year after year. In 1890, sales were 4,000 barrels, 5,000 a year later, and more than double to 9,000 by 1896. We'll cover this facility in much more detail later in the presentation. Martin will eventually leave Menasha to start another brewery called Walter Brothers Brewery in Colorado. These two facilities will keep joint Walter Brothers name and sell the, the gold label along with combining advertising. Martin was 10 years old when he traveled to America with his older brothers. He worked with several brothers, especially Chris, to develop the Menasha facility. Once Menasha was established, it was evident that the facility could not support two growing families. Martin went out west. On his way to California, he stopped in Pueblo, Colorado and saw an opportunity. Martin and his wife will have eight children. However, she'll pass away in 1895. In 1898, Martin purchased the Pueblo Brewery for $7,000. In the tradition of the Wisconsin Brothers, Martin established his own brewery. 
This time, however, he combined with Chris to keep the Walter brothers name. Not only the name Martin, and not only the name Martin will take on several of Menashe's executives, including Chris's son-in-laws, John Hubruski and Wally Pierce. Martin will pass away in 18, excuse me, in 1920 at age 58 of a stroke. As mentioned, Martin headed west and determined Pueblo, Colorado, an opportune place to start brewing. The brewery set his sight on it changed hands at least 16 times in 30 years. Brewed with clean Colorado water, the company supplied beer under dozens of labels in more than 20 states. It will become a Pueblo legend. Originally named Mountain Dew, eventually called the Gold Label. This label will be sold both Pueblo and Menasha. Martin will expand his brewery in Colorado to include Trinidad acquiring an existing brewery through a loan default. After Martin's death, Martin's son, Martin II, took over the family business. In 1975, the brewer property was sold and the doors of Walters were closed by the new owners. Five other siblings will play roles in the Walter breweries. The oldest sibling, Jacob, lived on Doty Island worked at the Menashe facility. He died from cancer at Theta, in, at Theta Clark in 1913 at age 71. At the time of his death, he was vice president of the Menashe plant. Brother Matt helped set up the Menashe brewery and moved back to Germany around 1890. Older sister Anne would marry Jacob Dorer, who also immigrated from Germany. Jacob, being a skilled brewer and malster, worked at Paft and Miller with the Walter brothers. He was owner and partner of the Eau Claire Brewery. In 1904, Ann and Jacob moved to California to start up their own brewery, the, the Eureka Brewing Company. Younger sister, Christina, moved to Spencer and would marry John Eicher. They were co-owners of the, the Eau Claire facility. Christina will pass away in 1898 at age 34. Brewery, established in 1856 in West Bend, would later become West Bend Brewing Company. A moneymaker from the start, it was one of the best breweries of its size. In 1911, Appleton Brothers, Martin and Charles Walter, George's son, purchased the West Bend Brewery. Martin sold most of his interest in the Appleton facility and moved his family to West Bend. One of the labels that the brothers purchased was the Lithia Label Beer. It was a special brew as the water used in brewing contained lithium carbonate. The famed lithium and lithia beer came from the well water near the brewery. This brewery became the sixth of the Walters organization. It also revealed the emergence of the next generation of Walters in the beer industry. The torch was passed to the next generation. Early on, after George's death, the Appleton facility was reorganized and run by his sons. With the death of Martin, his son Martin II took over the family business in Pueblo. Three generations of Walters will own the Pueblo facility. Martin II joined his Wisconsin cousins from Appleton to buy their uncle's Eau Claire facility. This location would also be run by three generations. Ownership in the Menasha facility was outside of the family, however, Operations and management continued with Chris's sons and son-in-laws. In this section, we'll discuss Chris Walter's family, Walter Brothers Brewery in three stages, and the end of an era. Earlier we discussed Chris, now we'll take a little deeper look into his life. As we said, he was born in Germany. After he finished his education, he drove a milk wagon for two years. He immigrated to America with $5 in his pocket. 
At age 21, Walter opened a saloon in Appleton. Two years later, he re relocated the business to the town of Freedom, then later to Apple Creek. In 1887, he returned to Appleton to work for his brother George for six months. The next year, he became involved in the Island Brewery in Menasha. This would be his passion for over two decades. Once, in, once established in his business, he became very involved in several local business ventures. He was on the board of directors of Lakeside Paper, also the largest shareholder and president of the Wisconsin Automobile, Automobile Corporation. Chris was a prominent Menasha Civics leader. He was an alderman and president of the Common Council. He was also a member of the Menasha Elks and Twin Cities Lodge of Odd Fellows. In the early 1900s, Chris began to invest and build saloons. He uh, built saloons around Nina and Menasha. This would help him sell and distribute his beer. One of those was a Hotel Menasha in 1906. In 1924, Chris sold the hotel and bought property in, in Florida. He also was out in California where he was became involved in many endeavors. He owned an orange grove and an oil producing property near Los Angeles. He was also board of directors of the First National Bank. This young boy from Germany with five dollars to his name became a successful and respected man. Doty Island was very fortunate to have the Walter, Walters family part of their community. <clears throat> Let us look at Chris's children. All five of Chris and Amelia's children lived on Doty Island. Oldest son John will inherit his parents' Nicolay uh, Boulevard home. He was treasurer and manager of the Menasha facility. Fred and Rose Walter lived on Annap Street, next door to the business. Fred was associated with the brewery and managed properties owned by the brewery. One, a soft drink parlor that was on the corner of 3rd and Racine Street. Cliff and Catherine Pierce built a home on Naaman Street and Nicolay Boulevard. Cliff was Menasha's president in 1900. Walter and Molly Pierce lived on the corner of Kai's and Elm. He was, he was Colorado's startup secretary and treasurer and president of Menasha. John and Lizzie, who, John and Lizzie Hubruski first moved to Colorado where John would help start up the facility with Wally and Martin. Later, he would move back to Menasha and build a home on Naaman Street. Fred's Island Home is the only structure that's not existing today. In the 1850s, three Menasha breweries were starting up. First, Hall and Lusher Brewery, later to become Wentz Brewery and Menasha Brewery, uh, Menasha Brewery Company, then J. Dowdler Brewery, and last, the Island City Brewery. The building pictured was erected in 1881 after the fire that destroyed the original structure. This was the largest building of its kind in northeastern Wisconsin. Here is an 1887 article about the Island Brewery and this new building. The Island Brewery is a solid brick structure, 140 feet long, 60 feet wide, and five stories high. It was erected at a cost of nearly $50,000 and is supplied with the latest improved machinery. Its capacity is 80 barrels of beer per day and the value of its annual product approximates $150,000. Mr. Figure intends to run it to its fullest capacity shortly in order to supply the rapidly increasing demand for his beer, which he ships in large quantities to Appleton, Chilton, Wapaka, Stevens Point, and other towns along the line of the Wisconsin Central Railway. The Island Brewery had several owners through the first 37 years. Original owner, Pete Caspery, in 1868, sold to John and Jacob Meyer. These brothers were born in Germany, emigrated to Milwaukee in 1870, 1847, 
Habermal and Miller will buy from the, from the mayors for $20,000 in 1871. Then Henry Sherry, Henry Hewitt, and Ed Fugger each tried their hands at the brewery. By October 1887, the brewery was bankrupt. <clears throat> three failures in three years. Chris, along with several brothers and Frank Fries, will purchase a facility and the property for $9,000, less than the original, uh, less than half of the original asking price. The Walter brothers will buy Fries' share out <coughs> shortly thereafter. The Walter brothers rapidly built up the brewery and began vigorously pushing their beer deep into the northwest and northern Wisconsin market. Immediately focused on upgrading and expanding the facility, it will be one of the breweries taking advantage of the newest technologies. The next 15 years saw substantial expansion, such as a two-story, 60 by 90 malt house, extensive uh, enlargement of the bottling facility, wide-ranging electrical work, and an erection of 60,000 barrel grain house. The brewery will eventually consist of two four-story buildings with over 50,000 square foot of floor, of floor space. In addition, a grain elevator and a barn to house the delivery house, uh, the horses. Equipped with the most modern machinery known to the industry of the time, the brewery will capitalize on being adjacent to the tracks of three major rail lines, expanding business to all parts of the state. <coughs> As with all breweries, Prohibition caused a lot of frustration and business dis disruptions. Our Doty Island Brewery was no different. Walter Brothers were indicted and fined for various violations of the new Prohibition laws. One of the offenses included manufacturing 400 barrels of beer with too much alcohol content, <laughs> costing them $1,100 in fines and $6,000 in double tax penalty. Management worked to gain approval of manufacturing beer with a lesser alcohol content and finally received a permit to brew a 3.2 beer. <clears throat> the Walter Brothers Brewery delivered their first post-repeal repeal beer on July 1st, 1933. As prohibition ended, so did the Walters' ownership of the brewery. In 1934, Charles Kulnick will buy the brewery. He was a brewer from Kakana, and in the early 1900s, already had bought interest in the Menashe facility. The Walter family will remain on the board of directors and management, as Cliff Pierce will be the president. Charles Kulnick will pass away three years later. In 1937, the new owners, new owners become Jack Meyer of Chicago and Dick Hansen of Alabama. In 1947, they sell 65% of their interest to Charlie Hoppensberger of Appleton. Throughout the turbulent 40s, Walter Pierce will remain a consistent, forward-moving management style. While his title will change from secretary to treasurer to vice president, and a president throughout the decade. Walter Brothers Menasha was well known for its labeled beer. The company brewed a splendid brand of lager beer, beers, including a pale, pilsner, and bock. Their gold label was an exceptionally fine quality brand. Here are the labels used before, during, and after prohibition. Let's take a deeper look at a couple of the better known labels. K Pale was introduced to the market in 1937. K stood for the current owner, Kulnick. Officers of Walter Brewery hosted more than 500 to tour the brewery and taste the new K Pale. Sales of this new brew were modest, but a nice offering to an expanding beer drinking population. You'll notice the phone number of the Walters Brewery is yeah. two. <laughs> <laughs> a 
Established in 1891, the gold label was the only label and recipe brought back into production after prohibition. Customers appreciated the extra smoothness. Only a beer which has been fully aged can be croissant, the German word for nature's carbonation, and the Menasha facility had plenty of storage space to leisurely age their beer. Walter's Gold Label was an all-year-round beverage. Home delivery service in the area was available by phoning Menasha 2. A little-known fact, Menasha 1 was the Menasha Hotel. By the 1940s, sales of gem beer outpaced Gold Label and became the brewery's flagship label. Gem was produced in three brews, Gem Beer, Gem Bach, and Gem Pilsner. Noted as a pure 100% grain beer, fully aged, smooth and mellow, a flavor never forgotten. Here is what was said of the Gem brand. A German word, Zufigkeit, describes Gem Beer best. This word's meaning in English is agreeable, pleasing taste, flavor of the highest quality yet not filling. In short, they want more and more. This is the highest compliment paid any brew by connoisseurs of the old world. It is the same compliment lovers of Bach are paying Gem. The pride that goes with brewing at Walter Brothers Brewery permits only the adherence to strict old formulas of this traditionally fine beer. It has been with constant pride, according to Hoffensberger, that the company advertises 100% pure grain in connection with the brewing of Gem Pilsner, and the same is declared for Gem Bach. In the 1940s, sales at Walters picked up with the help of Little Gem Pilsner. In 1941, Gem was among the first Wisconsin beers packaged in seven ounce bottles and immediately became one of the fastest growing beers in the state. In 1952, a, spe a special Gem Bach Christmas production was well received. Thousands of customers looking for the darker, smooth, creamy beer requested the specialty beer be kept year-round. In the mid-50s, a pricing war broke that will affect the profitability and image of the Gem brand. Nineteen fifty one saw thirty thousand barrels of beer roll off the production line. Volume was up. The profits were substantially down as the gem beer was fighting an image the Walter Brothers could not control. The flagship brand was losing the quality image it worked hard to maintain as the gem pilsner was gaining a reputation as the cheapest beer in town. In nineteen fifty three an attempt was Attempt to shake the cheapest beer image, Walter Brothers reformulated the recipe and undertook an ad campaign promising that the gem beer had revived that old-fashioned real beer character. It was too late. Sales fell precipitously after the recipe was changed. By the spring of 1956, desperation was setting in as sales were averaging under $12,000 barrels a year. The last straw was June 27, when Brewers and the brewery's top sales agent, Paul Lemrick, a Menasha alderman, left Walters to work for Chief Oshkosh Beer. Two days later, the brewery announced they would cease production and close the facility. So in 1956, the Walter, brewery, the Walter Brothers Brewery on Doty Island closed its doors. Menasha's hundred years of brewing ended. In 1960, the wrecking ball came to the facility and St. Patrick's Parish would purchase a majority of the property. Today, you can look online for many items with the Walter Brothers Brewery logo and labels on it. From coasters, glasses, bottles, and cases, these pieces can be very expensive as they continue to be in demand. Even though the brewery is gone, you'll have a chance to see a part of our Doty Island history. 
These are a couple of artifacts on display in the Menasha Historical Society. We've covered a lot of ground this evening. We started with a presentation and discussion on location, the corner of education, salvation, and damnation, and ended with a 100-year run of a brewery on Doty Island. In between, we discussed a family that emigrated to this country from Germany and their impact on beer making in Wisconsin. It was a pleasure presenting this program to you guys this evening. We thank you for taking the time to watch the presentation and hope you enjoyed it. We'll end this presentation with a 1916 article concerning the Walter Brothers that was on our Doty Island. Menasha Beer has long enjoyed a reputation that has brought much advertising and financial revenue to the city. The industry has grown to such an extent that it is one important enterprise of the entire city and is still growing. The Walter Brothers Brewing Company has a statewide prestige and a business that speaks volumes for the quality of its product and the business methods. In 1888, the present company took over the business. Growth came as a matter of course, and five years later, the company was incorporated. Today, the group of splendid modern structures on the island contain more than 50,000 square feet of floor space and constitute one of the finest brewing and malting plants north of Milwaukee. The company brews a splendid brand of beer, porter, malt, etc., and does a large bottling trade, their gold label beer being exceptionally fine and a food product of the highest value. The company's plant is equipped with the most modern machinery known to the industry and adjacent to the tracks of three railroads affording excellent shipping facilities, the firm's business extending to all parts of the state. Mr. Christian Walter, who is active manager of the firm's affairs, is a thoroughly public-spirited citizen whose every effort is directed towards the city's growth and prosperity. His services in the public good are such as to deserve high commendation from all classes of citizens. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the program. I'm sorry I don't have samples tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? But thank you again for joining us. If you have any questions and you'd like to ask Tom or share stories with him, please come up um, after and, and share that with him and ask any questions you may have. Thanks again for joining us and coming out on this very cold night. <laughs>